Um, thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Just City uh, for their amazing work on behalf of justice in this community. I want to thank the Benjamin Hooks Institute for not just for tonight, uh, but for all of the programs uh, that they provide both here on campus and to the broader community. Uh, I want to thank uh, Daphne McFerrin and Roy Tremel and uh, Daniel Keel. And in particular, I want to thank the entire Book Award Committee who was just up on here stage with me. When I, when I saw, y'all saw the same finalists I saw. And when I saw them, I was like, oh, that's cool. You know, it would be good to be a finalist. I'm not going to win, but. Uh, and then when they told me uh, that the book had won, it was, it was quite thrilling. Um, and it's an uh, incredible company, and I'm just honored to be uh, in the same category as some of those other books that you saw. I thought with that, what I would do tonight is tell you all a little bit about why I decided to try to write this book and, and go from there. My motivations for writing the book were really twofold. The first one is, and we'll see if this mic, mic picks up. Can you all hear me okay or no? No. Yes? No? How about that? All right. If you can't hear me, I'll go back over there. All right. So my first motivation really came from the fact that I'm the kind of person, I don't know if there's anybody else in the audience like this, but I'm the kind of person who, if I see a movie or a television show and there's no African American characters represented, I get very frustrated. And in particular, what bothers me, which is almost as bad as no characters, is there'll be one character and that person is supposed to stand in and represent the entire African American community. And I know that's not the truth. I know there's a complexity and a diversity and a multiplicity of perspectives in the black community. And I wanted to write a book. I knew that I wanted to write a book that, that showed those differences, that showed a rich intellectual and political and cultural history, showed the disagreements that happen in people's living rooms and that also happen in politics, but that don't often get portrayed when we get these more kind of one-dimensional accounts. And now my other motivation came not as a historian, but really came from my experience as a public defender, my experience in the criminal justice system, which I'll refer to sometimes as the criminal justice system. You'll also hear me refer to it as the criminal legal system, because like more and more people, I'm starting to wonder and question whether that system deserves to have the title justice in it. But there's a lot of stories in this book, and one of them is of a young man that I represented by the name of Brandon. Brandon was a teenage client of mine, 15 years old. He had been charged with possession of marijuana and possession of a gun. And he was facing sentencing. He had pled guilty. And he was facing sentencing, Superior Court, Washington, D.C. And I was his public defender. And I had taken the job of being a public defender because I viewed it, as I view it still, as the civil rights issue of my generation. My parents met in the original civil rights movement. They were activists in SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. They were an interracial couple. My dad is black and my mom is white. They're an interracial couple at a time when those marriages were illegal in many states in this country. And their generation, and I say there, but I know I'm not going to call anybody out. There's some people in the room who, when I say there, I'm talking to you, I'm talking about your generation. Their generation, right, changed and transformed this country. Theirs was the generation that marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, that went to Tent City 
in Fayette County that fought for the right to vote, that faced down Bull Connor's dogs, that went to D.C. 250,000 strong for the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Their generation brought us the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, the Fair Housing Act of 68. I mean, they'll, they teach you in school that Congress passed those laws, the President signed them, and that's true. But don't for a minute believe that any of that act happened but for mobilization, people marching, people agitating, people demanding. They did that, and they made it possible for me to have opportunities that were unimaginable to somebody in my father's generation. And yet and still, when I was graduating from law school, I could see that there was unfinished business to the civil rights movement. And the place that I saw it, and I'm not saying it's the only place, but the place that I saw it was in our criminal legal system. Because even with that change and progress that I just described, when I was graduating from law school, the numbers were already known. One in three young black men under cr criminal justice supervision. Black women, the largest single growing part of the prison system. The United States having passed Russia and South Africa to earn the dishonor of being the world's largest jailer. 5% of the world's population and 25% of its prisoners. These things were all known in the 1990s when I was leaving law school. And I had seen some of the changes and transformation in American society and in policing practices that would produce those numbers. When I was a kid growing up, I saw structural changes. When I was a child, Two blocks from my house in Atlanta, I grew up in a mostly African-American, working class, borderline middle class neighborhood. Two blocks from my house in one direction and in the other direction were two huge buildings. In one direction was a General Motors plant. In the other direction was the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. That's when I was a kid. Now fast forward, I'm graduating from law school. One of those buildings has shut down job shipped overseas. The other building had built an addition. It had built an extra wing. And I don't think I need to tell this audience which is which. I could see it in what police were doing in my own neighborhood. I'm African American, but I'm so light the police didn't always know it. So I could see differences in how I was treated when I was walking by myself versus when I was with my friends. All of those changes that I saw that helped to produce mass incarceration were the things that made me want to be a public defender. They were the things that brought me to be standing next to Brandon in Superior Court asking for probation. I had a letter from a teacher and a counselor at his school. It was his first arrest. His mother and grandmother were there in court, sitting in the front row. They wanted him to come home. The prosecutor in the case, she was asking for him to go to Oak Hill. Now, Oak Hill, it's like a lot of juvenile facilities. It was D.C.'s juvenile jail, and it's like a lot of juvenile jails around the country. It combines a nice-sounding name, Oak Tree on a Hill, with a really brutal reality. It was a place where drugs and violence were rampant. It was a place where... When you left, you always left as a child worse off than when you entered. The judge had to make the decision in the case, Judge Curtis Walker, and I should say I changed the names of everybody in all of the stories to protect the identity of my clients, but, so he's not his real name, but he's a real judge. And he's looking out in the courtroom, so what does he see on this day? He sees a young black man facing sentencing. He sees an African-American defense lawyer, a black prosecutor. The judge himself is African-American. In D.C., that's not unusual. About 40% of the bench is African-American. And he looks out, and he looks at Brandon, and he says, Son, Mr. Foreman's telling me about that you had a tough life. You deserve a second chance. Well, let me tell you about tough, son. Let me tell you about Jim Crow segregation. See, the judge had been a child in those years. And he proceeded to lecture Brandon on what it was like. 
And then he says, so here's the thing, son. People fought, people marched, people died for your freedom. Dr. King died for you. And I tell you this, he didn't die for you to be running and gunning and thugging and carrying on, embarrassing your family, embarrassing your community, carrying that gun. So I hope Mr. Foreman is right. I hope one day you turn it around. But today in this courtroom, actions have consequences. And your consequence is Oak Hill. And he locked him up. And I was so angry. I was so furious. I mean, think about it. The judge had taken the same history, the same decade, the same heroes that I just told you motivated me to become a public defender and fight for Brandon's freedom, and he had used them in this twisted moral rationale for why he had to lock Brandon up. Over time, as I began to work through my anger, and I'm still in process on that. But as I began to work through it, I began to think about the fact that, you know, the judge wasn't alone. The city council that passed the gun laws and the drug laws that Brandon was being sentenced under, that's a majority African-American city council. The police force in D.C. at the time, and still is, majority African-American. The police chief was black. The mayor was black. The chief prosecutor in this city was none other than Eric Holder, before anybody outside would know his name. And here is the thing, even with all that representation in local government and some measure of control, not total control, but some measure of control over what happened in our criminal courts, we in our community were doing the same thing that the rest of the country was doing. We were passing the same laws, we were enacting the same policies, and we were producing the same results. I told you that one in three young black men nationally was under criminal justice supervision. In D.C. at the time, it was one in two. And so I sat down and I felt like I had to ask the question and try to answer it of how did this come to be? How did it come to be that even in this majority African-American jurisdiction, we would end up doing over the last 50 years the same thing as the rest of the country. What was so powerful in this country? What was so all-encompassing? What was so omnipresent that we followed the same path? And that's the question of the book. Now, in the time that they've given me tonight, I'm not going to be able to answer that question. But I have good news for you. Outside, <laughs> you can find the book with the answer. Some of you already have it. And I want to say one thing in particular too to the students or any community members. One thing that I always, uh, that's important for me to mention. So when I was in college and law school, the only way I made it through was financial aid. Heavy financial aid. <coughs> civil rights, like, people like civil rights activists don't make a lot of money. So my parents didn't have that much. And financial aid is great, but it never covers any extras. It only covers the very basics. And so when I was in school, I couldn't do things like afford a, a book if I went to a book event. So I can't tell you that I thought when I was in college or law school that I would write a book one day. I didn't. But when my, I did write a book, I told myself that when I go to colleges and when I go to community centers, I'm going to make sure that everybody knows that they can operate on a pay-what-you-can basis when you go out there to the bookseller. So I do not want let cost to be an obstacle for anybody who is interested in purchasing a book. So I can't answer the question that I just posed in the talk, but I do answer it on the, on the pages, and I hope you will take my offer and take a look. Let me, with the last time that I have, though, talk about, as Daniel mentioned, you know, a bit of hope. And I want to talk for the rest of my time, I want to talk not so much about how that came to be, but the moment that we're in now and what can we as a nation and what can this community in Memphis do to respond to this human rights crisis. And I'm just going to, 
I'm going to put out a few ideas and like Just City, I'm on social media, I'm on Twitter. If you want to hear more about my ideas on this, uh, get, get with me at, James, at Jay Foreman Jr. But I'm just going to give you a couple of things that are on my mind right now. And the first thing I want to say is not really, it's not a specific policy idea, but it's a way of thinking about the problem. And it comes from a conversation that I had with my mother. I went to a lot of schools as a kid. I went to 10 schools for 12 grades, um, which is like, like I was saying before, there's a lot of great things about being a child of civil rights activist, but, but we moved a lot. But one of the not so good things is stability, and we moved a lot. And I was in a new school. I was in 10th grade. It was my first couple days in this school. And I was in the bathroom, and I saw an incident that really bothered me. And it was basically, I didn't really quite have the name for it at the time, but it was basically bullying. And a kid was being bullied based on the sexual orientation and how he presented himself. And I didn't have the words for it, but I knew it was wrong, and I knew it upset me. And I went home, and I told my mom this story. And I was like, I, I described her what happened, and I had this whole plan. I was like, here's what the principal could do. Here's what the assistant principal can do. Here's what the dean of students could do. I had ideas for what my mom could do. She was always up in the school about this, that, and the other thing. <laughs> anyway, and my mom heard all my ideas, and she was like, well, that's great, James. I appreciate you bringing that, raising that with me, and I'm going to think about that. She said, but I just have one question for you. And I said, what's that? She said, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And I take that question to this day very seriously. And so what I want to say for all of us as we sit here, when we look at a problem that's as big as mass incarceration, it can feel overwhelming. But ultimately, the way that we're going to have to dismantle it is step by step, is brick by brick, and it's going to be local. This is fundamentally a local problem. The national discussion, what happens out of DC, Criminal justice reform, that gets a lot of attention in the media. But this is a state, county, and local problem. 88% of prisoners in this country are in state, county, and local prisons, not the federal. 85% of law enforcement is state, county, and local. And what that means, that really invites us to think about what can I do? Because it's really, what can I do at a local level? Couple, couple ideas. And I'm going to start as local as, as, as I can. You know the, the, the Fayette County movement, the Tent City movement, that's currently, is the current exhibit? Is the exhibit up? The exhibit is up. That movement started because of discrimination in the jury process. The first thing was a trial, and there were no black jurors. So I want to talk for a minute about jury service. Because most people in the room, if you're like most people I know, when you get your notice to serve on a jury, the first thing you do is put it as low as you can under all the magazines and, and anything People don't want to deal with it. I can tell you, though, as a public defender, there was nothing that was more frustrating than seeing the kind of people that would come to an event like this, the kind of people that care enough to want to come have a conversation about mass incarceration, taking themselves out of the jury pool when we were picking juries. People say, oh, I don't trust the police. I can't be fair. I don't like the government. I don't like the criminal justice system. I can't be fair. Well, let me tell you all something. If everybody who thinks that there's something wrong with having the world's largest prison system takes themselves out of jury service, then we're going to be left with a pool of jurors who are good with mass incarceration. And that pool of jurors is going to keep recreating mass incarceration over and over again. So whether it's the grand jury deciding what charges to bring, or whether it's the pettit jury deciding on guilt or innocence, I want to ask you to remember that the right to vote in this country from Reconstruction on, the civil rights leaders that fought for the right to vote understood that there were two places that you got to vote. The ballot box, yes, but the jury box as well. 
So understand that that is a political right and do everything in your power to exercise that political right. That's personal. Right? Everybody can, can make a decision about that. Let me talk, mention something more at the level of the system. The most powerful single actor in the criminal legal system is the county prosecutor. Nobody's more powerful. There's a lot, this is a, a diffuse, dispersed system. There's lots of power in different places, but that's the most powerful. They decide what charges to bring. They decide what sentence to ask for. They decide where to file charges in such a way that they're going to invoke mandatory minimums or not. They decide all that. Well, guess what, y'all? That's a local office. That's a county office. And for the last 50 years, the reason we got mass incarceration is that all across the country, people ran for prosecutor on a platform of, I'm going to lock up more people than the one before me for longer, and I'm going to keep them in harsher conditions. And a lot of us didn't even think we had a choice. And a lot of times, we didn't have a choice. The two people running were bad and worse. Well, something is happening in this country. Starting in 2015 and then picking up steam in 2016, people started to run on platforms of, I'm going to stop asking for bail on people that can't afford it. I'm going to stop prosecuting these low-level drug offenses. I'm not going to ask for the longest sentence, and I'm not going to ask for mandatory minimums because that's often not appropriate. They ran on campaigns of, I'm not going to seek the death penalty. Ten years ago, you would have been laughed off the ballot if you said that you, that was your platform and you were going to run for local prosecutor. But they weren't laughed off the ballot because local activists, Local citizens went door to door on a local level, and in Florida, in Alabama, in Texas, in Denver, in Chicago, in Philadelphia, in St. Louis, in Boston, in all of these cities, many of them had never elected a progressive prosecutor in the history of that city or county. They did. There's a guy in Texas, a former defense lawyer, he has the words not guilty tattooed on his chest. I mean, I'm hardcore defense, but there's no not guilty tattooed anywhere. He ran for prosecutor and he won. Rachel Rollins, African-American woman with a vision, just ran in Boston. They said you can't get elected in that city at the county level as an African-American woman, and definitely not running on that kind of campaign, she won by a huge margin. St. Louis, Wesley Bell, same thing. Philadelphia, Larry Krasner. Philadelphia's had tough on crime prosecutors. They've been black and they've been white, but the one thing they've been is locking up as many people as they can. For 50 years, the police union laughed when he put his name on the ballot. They said, that's hilarious that he thinks he can win. But local citizens and local activists and people said, I'm tired of this. Folks went door to door and he won. He won and he's now the prosecutor and he's proceeding to shrink the size of the, the number of people in the Philadelphia jail as fast as he can. So what I want to say to y'all is it's time for Shelby County. There is no reason, there is nothing, ab there is nothing about Shelby County that makes it less possible for it to happen here than in all of those other places that I mentioned. And so I think, is it when it, 2022? See, I'm a professor, I can say whatever I want. 2022, so it's a little ways out. But it's not too early to start organizing. And it's not too early to start figuring out who you're gonna run. Because that's part of it, is you have to have a good candidate. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just to note, even before 2022, judges. That's the other piece of it. These elected judges 
have been doing the same thing. Most of them are out of the prosecutor's offices. And then they go onto the bench and they do the same thing. They're basically prosecutors with robes. That will happen as long as we tolerate it. And it will stop happening once as a community we say we've had enough. We have a different vision of justice and we want to put people in those positions who have a different vision of justice. All right, y'all probably like, oh man, this guy is so political. Let me talk to you about something else that is deeply, deeply important to me. And it's something at an educational institution I have to mention. And it does have to do with education. It's been a big part of my life's work. And with my mom's story in my head, a couple of years ago, I started thinking, okay, well, I'm writing this book and I give talks, but what, what more can I do? What more can I do? And the, the way that most of us is gonna engage in sustained social change is by picking an issue that is very close to our hearts, to our skill set, to our passion. You have to find something that, it's, that is what you do already and then figure out how can I transfer that into making our criminal system more humane. And so for me it was education. I teach a class called Race, Crime, and Punishment and it's a class that I've taught for years at law school. And about three or four years ago I got trained in a program called Inside Out Prison Exchange which I know exists uh, on this, a version of it exists on this campus. What Inside Out Prison Exchange does is it trains professors to teach the class that you already teach at your home university, but you teach it inside of a prison. And the class is made up of half students who are incarcerated and half students from your home university. So now every week I drive out to a prison in the state of Connecticut, and I teach a seminar with 20 people sitting in a seminar circle, reading books like mine and others, studying the criminal justice system. 10 of them are incarcerated, and 10 of them are from Yale. It is the most powerful and impactful teaching that I do. It brings more meaning to my life than anything that I do in the classroom. It's transformative for my Yale students, right, who are supposed to be studying the legal system, but the way we teach about the legal system in law school is these dry, abstracted cases that have almost no connection to the real world, and now all of, all of a sudden you're studying the criminal system plopped in, in a prison with people who have all been arrested, all been tried, all been convicted, and have a perspective on that that nobody in law school and no professor in law school can truly give you. And it's also transformative for the incarcerated students. The RAND Corporation has studied this issue. They found for every dollar we invest in education in prison, we as a society get five dollars in return. And we get it because if you allow people the chance to get educated, when they come out, they are more likely to work and they're less likely to be rearrested. But forget about the numbers. Just listen, just hear the voices. So one of the, one of the people that I taught at the end of last semester, he wrote in his evaluation, he said, I like the law and the policy that we learned in this class. He said, but most of all, most of all, what I liked was that when I entered the seminar circle, I was treated like I was smart. I was treated like I had something to say, like I had ideas. I was treated like, and I even felt like, an intellectual. And that's never how I feel normally in prison. So I would encourage you, if you're a professor, to think about how you can get trained in the Inside Out program. If you're a student here, I would encourage you to go up to your professors and say, I, talk, I just heard this guy Foreman speak. He talked about this class. It sounded good. Why don't you get trained in it so that you can offer that kind of class here? You won't regret it. One more area that I want to mention, 
and I can't mention prosecutors and I can't men mention judges without saying something about my true heart, which is public defenders and public defense. I would ask all of you to think about connecting with Just City, connecting with the Shelby County Public Defender's Office, supporting their work in whatever way you can, including by serving on a jury, but not just that. <coughs> supporting their advocacy efforts, buying some of their t-shirts, which are outside, which will support their work. I just bought a couple of them myself. Because public defenders, fundamentally, more than anybody else, we're not the most necessarily most powerful actors in the system in the sense that we can immediately make the, the, the life or death decision that a prosecutor gets to make. But we are the most powerful actors in the system in this way. We're the most powerful actors in the system because fundamentally transformation of the current system is going to come because we lift up the individual voices and we humanize and we tell the stories of people that right now are treated as labels and people that are demonized and people that are stigmatized and people that are just defined by felon and violent offender and criminal and inmate and prisoner. Their whole identity, their whole life story pushed down into a word, a phrase. The people that can disrupt that, the only people that can disrupt that in the criminal system are public defenders. We have to have adequate caseloads. We have to have adequate resources, which we don't in any state in this country. <clears throat> but public defenders are the ones that get to stand next to somebody who the entire system wants to vilify and demean and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, your honor, wait a minute, system, there is a person, this is my client, and let me tell you, and when the judge tries to shut you up, no, your honor, I, no, I'm not done. I'm not done. There are things you don't know, and I'm here to tell you about them. That's the public defender. We lift up that voice. Brian Stevenson, right, hero to many of us, says that nobody should be judged right, by their, worst, their single worst act. But defenders are the ones that give, who's going to give the rest of the context? The prosecutor's telling you about the single worst act. The judge only wants to hear about the single worst act. We, the defenders, are the ones that tell the rest of the story of your life that tell the trauma that you experienced as a child, that tell the services that you never received, that tell that even with all of that, the hope and the beauty and the opportunity that exists in your life, if we will give you a chance today instead of just locking you up. So whenever, whatever way you can, I ask you to support the work of your local public defenders. It's so the last thing I'm going to say, and it's not a particular, you know, I've given you a list of some things that are on my mind of how I think we can push back locally and individually against mass incarceration. And I just want to close with not a particular idea, but a way of thinking about this problem. And I mentioned a story with my mom, and I can't sit down without telling you um, about a conversation that I had with my father. And it was a couple years before he passed away. And we had watched a movie about the Civil Rights Movement. And when the movie was over, I said, what did you think? You know, you were there. What did you think of this representation of this movie? And he said, oh, I liked it. I liked that. He said, I liked that they portrayed this history on film. Because more people watch films than read books. We're going to change that tonight, but <laughs> in general, that would be true. He said, but there is something I didn't like. I said, what was that? He said, I didn't like the fact that they made it seem like everybody was in the movement, that it was popular. He said, you know, it wasn't, that's not true. 
He said, when I was an organizer for SNCC and I would go onto college campuses to try to recruit people, the administrators would run us off campus. They didn't want us convincing students to drop out of school and join the movement. He said, even Dr. King, the biggest hero of the movement, he was unpopular when he died. He had a two-thirds unfavorable rating. They did a Gallup poll. The March on Washington. It's like the only thing that is presented today as the history of the civil rights movement is the march, there's Dr. King at the March on Washington. And even then, we only get like three lines of the speech. That march, that iconic march, it was unpopular when it happened. They polled. 60% of Americans said, I think this will hurt the cause of the Negro. And my dad said, listen, I'm not telling you all this because I want credit for being there first. He said, the reason I'm telling you this is that the way that we tell this history has the effect of demoralizing and demobilizing your generation and future generations. And right now I'm talking to anybody who is an activist in the room, right? Because this is, my dad would say, listen, the problem with this history is yet you call a meeting and six people come and five of them were at the last meeting and you're like, well, what's wrong with our issue? What's wrong with us? Everybody was in the civil rights movement and now it's just six of us. And so this was my dad's point. He said, he said change when you are facing this apparently insurmountable obstacle, slavery, Jim Crow, mass incarceration. He said, people will tell you that change is impossible, that you will never defeat it. But if you ignore them and you mobilize and you win, the same people who told you that it was impossible will turn around and say, oh yeah, that was inevitable. And I was there too. And then they'll make a movie about it. I mean, they weren't there. There were 250,000 people at the March on Washington. That's amazing. But a decade later, 10 million people would say they were there. So this is what my dad was trying to tell me, and this is what I want to leave y'all with. Because somebody in this room is gonna have an idea that's better than anything I shared with you about how we can push back against mass incarceration and replace it with a justice system that deserves the name justice in it. A system that actually restores and protects communities. A group of you is gonna to come together around that idea. SNCC was started on a college campus. And you're gonna ignore the people that tell you that it can't be done and that change is impossible. And when you do that, you will defeat mass incarceration. And they will make a movie about you. And I will be there in the front row, popcorn in hand. Thank you. Do you want us to sit or we stand? Oh, we can sit, that's fine. Oh. Um, you tell me. Or you no, no, we'll sit, we'll sit, that's fine. I'm gonna yell. Um, <laughs> oh, you don't have a mic? No, I don't have Here, you go over there and I'll bring a chair. Oh. Okay. Or, or I'll stand next to you. That's, that's very nice. Um, I, my name is uh, Dr. Terrence Sucker. I'm an uh, associate professor in the Department of English. I want to thank Professor Foreman again for the wonderful book and for the even greater call for her action uh, that he gave us tonight. Uh, this is one of my favorite parts. We're going to do question and answer. Um, and so we have two runners, I think, with microphones in the back. Uh, and so please uh, raise your hands and ask your questions. I just want to set a couple of ground rules. Uh, and the first one is, please, let's just ask questions and not make statements <laughs> or like have leading statements up to the question. So let's just, we want to try to get as many questions and more importantly, as many answers as possible. Um, from our guest tonight, so 
please make sure you can just ask a question uh, as opposed to having like a 12 minute intro into question. Uh, and also, I want to encourage the students to, we also want to have students ask questions, so please students, make sure you raise your hand. Please don't make me call on you, because I recognize some of you in here, so please don't make me call your name out. Um, so I just want to sort of set that up. Uh, and so we can just start with hand raising, and the people and the people at the back will come and find you. Let's start right here on this side. It's, uh, this young man here at the front, and we'll just go from there. And if nobody has questions, I have questions. I'm young. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I need advice from you about how to handle the argument back about victims' rights. Because that's the blowback I get when we talk about, oh, you know, the snowflake argument. Why are you ad providing advocacy to the perpetrator? as opposed to on the other side of the fence is the victim. How do you handle that part of the argument? Yeah, you know, I'm glad you asked that question because I think it's, I think it is, it is fundamental and it's one of the most important questions that, that we have to grapple with. Um, and I think, you know, I have a few thoughts. The first one is that I don't think that the system we have now serves crime victims or survivors at all. I think that, you know, one of the things that you, one of the things that my book is able to do because it's centered in African American communities, you get to see on the pages how the divide between the victim and the defendant that is embodied in that challenge that you get, right? How kind of you, how, how useless that is as a construct because African American communities that have been disproportionately victimized by crime have been the same communities that have been disproportionately victimized by mass incarceration. So, and the victimization we're still suffering from. So, what we do now, if you're a victim of crime, what we do now, what we say to you is the way we are going to make you whole is by locking up the person who victimized you for as long as possible in the worst possible conditions. And here's the thing. If you tell a crime victim that, and then you tell them that the alternative is nothing, so your choice is that or nothing, which is what we currently give people, a lot of people will choose that because nothing is an affront. Nothing is an offense. Nothing means that what happened to me was nothing. I am nobody. I am nothing. My life is not valued. Nothing is what happens when police officers shoot unarmed black people, and when nothing happens, it is profoundly and deeply offensive in a country where black victimization has never been taken seriously, right? Black victimization has not been taken seriously starting with and beginning with slavery, which was a sustained hundred years criminal enterprise for which there was no recompense through to Jim Crow. I mean, my dad grew, grew up in Jim Crow, Mississippi, Jim Crow South Side of Chicago. He said, we didn't call the police in our neighborhood. The police weren't gonna come with a black victim, and if they came, the only thing we could be sure of is they were gonna make matters worse. So right now, so, so against that history, when the system tells black victims, or any victim, is prison or nothing, People say, well, prison, because nothing is not acceptable. The Alliance, I would encourage you to look at the website of the Alliance for Safety and Justice. It's a national organization. And they have done deep research, including opinion polls, asking crime survivors what they want in response to the harm that they have suffered. And their research shows, as I just suggested to you, 
And I'll say it again, Alliance for Safety and Justice, their research shows, as I said, that if you give people prison and nothing, they choose prison. But, but, if you give people, if you say to people, listen, we can give this prison sentence or we can give a set of options that includes restorative justice, that includes an apology, that includes restitution, that includes treatment for the person who committed the harm as well as treatment for the victim, right? Because many people are, have been traumatized by their crime and their trauma is not responded to by the other person being incarcerated. They want treatment and assistance themselves. If you give people that range of options and you say, well, okay, so option one is nothing. Option two is this more set of holistic services and option three is the prison sentence. Then overwhelmingly people choose option two. People choose that range. So I think that right now what we have to do is break this mentality that has existed in this country, which says the only way we can respond to crime is prison. And as soon as we break through that, and we're starting to, but as soon as we break through that, we will, ex we will open up a whole range of alternatives that then we can fight for. I see I have a lot of questions. I'm going to keep my answers short. Okay. Um, Edith Grayson, Supply Chain Manager major here at the University of Memphis. I Wait, project just, manager for what? Uh, no, uh, Supply Chain Management major. Supply Chain, chain Management yes, major. Got it. So I was wondering, a lot of times we hear go to the youth for these social problems. So what do you think, uh, because we are more susceptible to change, is what our elders seem to think. So what is the best way to go to the youth for these problems to, to help them? Incarceration. You said what is the best way to go to the youth? Yes, go to the youth. How can the youth help in this problem? I think, well, so to me the answer to that, I don't think that there's like a youth kind of specific answer because I think that the, the, the thrust of what I was trying to say throughout my talk was that this problem has crept into every nook and cranny of American society and therefore we're going to have to respond in turn. That is to say there's almost no place where we don't have to bring this more humane, redemption-oriented, second-chance mindset to, right? It's across the board. So the details, though, are going to depend on the issues in your local community. So the things that are, are worth fighting for right now today in Shelby County are gonna be a little bit different than the things that are worth fighting for in the next county or the next county or the next county. The question though is really how do you bring young people and allow young people to find their place in that movement? And there I would say it's not so much about identifying an issue there, I would say, it's about opening up the space for young people to have leadership roles and for young people to help set the agenda. Because right now, the way a lot of the social change, a lot of the activism works is the adults decide on what the issue is, and then they say, all right, young people, come in and participate in this issue. And then they try to figure out, okay, well, we're going to develop a messaging or a curriculum or something that's going to get, but that's backward. Because as long as the adults have already set up the agenda, and, they're just, and that was SNCC. SNCC was created. When SNCC was created, and please, if you don't know this history, uh, read up on it. You could look at my dad's book, but there's lots of other sources. SNCC was created because students around the country were participating in boycotts and participating in sit-ins. Sit and the ministers, SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and Dr. King, they wanted to bring in the students as the youth wing of SCLC. They said, come be the youth wing of SCLC. And Ella Baker, 
the formidable organizer that she was, at the initials Nick conference said, we can't become the youth wing of SCLC. If you become the youth wing of SCLC, the ministers are going to always call the shots. You need your own organization. And that's why, notice the first word in SNCC is student. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. That's why SNCC was founded as a student-led organization so that students could set the agenda. So that's what I would say. The best way to, to allow young people to ex express themselves is not to co-opt their voices, but to support them and let them take the lead. Good evening. I have two questions. Good evening. My first question, you mentioned earlier about the expansion of the prison in Atlanta. Yes. How, as a society, what are your thoughts about how society is framing it or positioning it as an economic boom for uh, cities when they have an expansion or where they build a prison? My second question, we were talking about um, being part of the jury pool. When you're not selected, you're not selected, and you have like 10 years, whatever the uh, term is, before you're actually eligible again. How do we go about changing or uh, shortening that time so then you can diversify the pool? Mm -hmm. Because if you have a shorter time, then you have that cycle that's uh, able to turn over quickly. So, in terms of prisons being a boom to the economy, I mean, come to, I'll take you to my neighborhood. And there's no question that we were a much better off neighborhood when we had the GM plant and a smaller prison than we had no GM plant and a larger prison. I think there's a lot of research out there. A lot of communities have been, um, have been in a way lied to because they've been persuaded that these prisons are gonna be good sources of employment um, and it's not that they aren't sources of employment, they are, um, but the question is what else could be, what else could that money be going towards? What else could that money be used for? Um, I mean, I was recently in Cleveland and they have this huge gleaming justice center and the school across the street is decrepit and falling apart. Um, and we spend significantly more money in every state incarcerating people than we do educate, uh, incarceration per individual compared to education per person. So I think that people have been lied to. Um, having said that, we do now have this big system, right? We do now have people in these jobs and folks don't want to lose their jobs. And so now the question that I think that we're going to have to face as a movement and as a community is how do we think about, it's really analogous almost to the, uh, uh, to the uh, oil and gas, um, which is to say, if you we have to replace those jobs with other jobs, right? It's like the Green New Deal. You can't just say we're going to shut these prisons down and we're not going to have anything for the people that used to work in them to do. We're going to have to come up with innovative ways to try to create alternative employment, employment that's ultimately more life affirming, that's more sustaining. I mean, a pri you know, the, the evidence is overwhelming about corrections officers have lower life expectancy, higher levels of stress, higher levels of domestic violence, higher levels of suicide. You create a toxic system and you put people in it, it's bad for everybody, including the people that have to work in it. Um, so what we have to do is we have to work to, but of course, if that's the only job that's available, it's better than none, which is why our movement has to be about being innovative and thinking about, I mean, there's a, there's a activist in North Carolina, uh, for example, we're able, um, and, and in New York State, uh, there's, a, um, uh, there's a, a, a milk not bars movement where they're trying to turn a couple of the prisons that basically have nobody left to be in them because crime has gone down and the incarceration, incarceration rate has gone down into dairy farms. Um, and in North Carolina, they did something similar. So I think we're going to have to be, you know, wildly creative and, and, and propose things that people are first going to say, what? That's, what are you even talking about? Um,
but that's what we're going to have to do. Uh, and as for juries, I don't know the details of it. That's a really like so much else. That's a city, typically a city and a county decision. Um, uh, that is to say, what are the rules? Sometimes it's a court. Uh, it's a court, a rule of court, that it, in terms of how long you how long you go before you get called again. Um, so I don't know the details of how that rule has been set here, but um, who, who's with Just City? Raise your hand. Let let her know where you are, because that's who you want to talk to to figure out what the rule is here and how y'all would go about changing it. Uh, hi, Professor uh, Foreman. Hi. In your article, Beyond Jim Crow, um, you argue that proponents of the new Jim Crow analogy ignore violent crimes committed by African Americans, which you argue is problematic. Do you feel that there is a possible correlation between violent crime within the African American community and the larger systemic and larger systemic oppression? Um, that's my first question. Also, um, you also argued that the new Jim Crow analogy has a negative impact on our understanding of the past, and I want to know if you could expound on that. Absolutely. So on the first one, um, I, you know, I wrote that piece that you're referring to in 2012, and one of my concerns then, which remains a concern to this day, um, is this uh, Ridge's distinction between violent and nonviolent. Um, because so much of the advocacy to try to challenge mass incarceration has the early, it's changed now, but early on, and, and again, some people are still doing this, uh, early on there was a big push that said, well, we need to focus on nonviolent drug offenders. Um, and what I was arguing that in that piece is that as long as we keep saying that, we're going to make two mistakes. One is we're going to miss the fact that the majority of people that are in prison are in prison for an offense that has been labeled a violent offense, which I want to be clear, offenses that we label as violent are not necessarily what everybody in the audience will think of when you think of a violent crime, but that is what they've been labeled by uh, the system. And so we can't limit our advocacy, so that's the kind of I guess the policy perspective and the moral perspective is I just don't think uh, there's any group of people that we should ever label as beyond our collective care and concern. There's nobody that we should define by uh, their single act. In terms of the second question, uh, it's again, it's sort of like the book. I wrote a whole article about it, so I'll do my best to you know, condense it in a couple of words. Um, but I felt like, and I think I've, I, this is an area where I've changed my view since I wrote that article. But at the time that I wrote it, I felt like there was a way in which um, that metaphor or that analogy uh, served to blind us to some of the particular horrors of slavery and Jim Crow. Um, but I'm not so sure I agree with that anymore. I want to get the woman in the blue blazer right down here. Uh, and then the young man in the purple shirt on this side. Hello. The school systems are also, what I know there's a term from uh, African American boys and girls getting more into detentions, yes. getting more interfacing with police, security. And I, there's a term that kind of schools and prison pipeline. Yes, pipeline. And I'm wondering if the schools are also getting more on the bandwagon about addressing this. Yes. So that you're you're right that it, so that school to prison pipeline it is the term. And I would say um, that in the last five years there's been a real uh, increased attention by educators to the role that school discipline policies play in funneling kids first into suspension and then into expulsion and then into the juvenile justice system and ultimately into the adult prison system. And, uh, and how, and that, and so that, that group of educators has started to turn to restorative justice approaches 
excuse me, within the school system. My, my brother actually is a restorative justice counselor at a middle school in Los Angeles. And um, basically, you know, what they do is they've created an entire, a whole alternative discipline system that involves students in face-to-face -face conversation, sometimes with peers, sometimes with fa family members. The conversation is centered on the harm that the person who was victimized, whether it was bullying or there was a physical assault, the harm that they felt. Um, it calls for accountability and apology and atonement on the, on the part of the person that harmed them. So the first thing you do is identify the harm. You figure out what needs to be done to redress it, who has the capacity to participate, to participate in redressing it, and then you come up with a series of steps. So it's a lot of talking, it's a lot of peace circles, um, it's a lot of, of apology and accountability, um, but they've found, the schools that are doing it and doing it well, have found massive reductions in suspensions, massive reductions uh, in expulsions um, because of that alternative system. So the challenge remains funding, right? Because we're talking about schools that are already stretched thin. I mean, I'm telling you, my brother is in Los Angeles, right? They just had this massive strike because they're in a school system where, like in, in, in the school that he teaches in, the school, the school nurse is there one day a week. So it's like if you get sick on Wednesday, but what about Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday? You know, it's crazy. So to do this, these alternatives well, it costs money, right? Suspensions and expulsions are cheap for the school system. They get rid of the kid. They might be expensive for the child, for their family, and for us as a society, because then they go into the juvenile system, which is way more costly. But the, for the school system's budget, it's inexpensive. And bringing in effective restorative justice programs initially costs more money. So that's the, that's the challenge. But the places that are doing it are seeing extraordinary results. I mean, I think this is going to be the last, the last one. Um, good evening, Jonathan Russell, business marketing major. Good I evening. wanted to ask you about one of your earlier points about um, an effective New Deal being sort of required to replace jobs that would be um, sort of taken away if we yeah. like, did away with all the prisons. And I was wondering if we were to address the communities that have been affected by mass incarceration as far as the damages and what about our thinking differently as far as maybe rehabilitation and education reform as opposed to just strict punishment. Do you think that could be a way is like possibly having an opportunity for job creation in those communities if we did something differently? I do, and it's a great point. I mean, let me, so I'll just give you a small example of this, which isn't nearly as transformative as of what you're talking about, but by talking about this little piece, then I think we could shed some light on the power of what you're suggesting. So I helped to start a school called Maya Angelou Charter School in DC, which works with kids that have been kicked out of school or locked up. And about 10 years after we started, the DC government got a new director of youth rehabilitation services, and he looked at the prison, Oak Hill, and he said, this thing is a disaster. And he asked my nonprofit to come in and take over the school. So we did. And we changed everything about the school. We made it a place of high standards and a place of, of relationships. But we had this challenge, which is we had all these corrections officers that were just used to mistreating kids, locking them up, throwing them in isolation. And we said, wait a minute they're actually undermining our ability to provide education. But what if we went to them and we retrained them to be tutors? Because right in the first model when we arrived, there'd be a classroom, a teacher, 10 kids, lots of them way behind, who would benefit from one-on-one -on -one attention. And two guards that would sit outside, look, po 
look in their head in every once in a while, and if anything went off, go in and beat some kids down and lock them up. And we were like, well, what if we train y'all to be tutors, and you come into the classroom, and you sit at a table with two kids, and you read with them? Now, you would have thought, when we made this suggestion, right, you would have just thought that we just, I don't know, ask them to, I don't even know what, just become like donut makers or something. It was like so far out from anything that they could imagine as being their job description. But we said, this is a better job. Like, you come to work every day. Wouldn't you like, wouldn't, I mean, do you really like sitting in the hallway and then beating up kids a couple, like, is that enjoyable? So what if you sat at a table and you read with them? And of course, most people said no, but you get one or two, and they start liking their jobs more. And then they talk, and you get three or four, five or six, and over time, I'm not going to, you know, sugarcoat it, is some people still there to this day that still want to do the old model. The rules don't allow it, but, they, but we've won over a bunch of people. And to me, that, if we take that insight and then we expand it in the way that you're suggesting, right, it would be like, well, what if we take all these jobs right now and completely reinvest them in community support, right? Like in my opinion, if we just took all of these folks and we said, well, we're just re re we're redesignating and we're re retraining you as social workers, right? And as tutors and as basketball coaches. And some people aren't gonna go along with the program and they're gonna have to be let go. Other people are gonna say, I need retraining and we're gonna give them the training. But over time, right, we will transform communities and transform neighborhoods in exactly the way that you're suggesting. So yes, so you ended with a question and a short answer to my, to my short answer to your question is yes, absolutely. 